webinar. My name is Scott Klein, Programs Manager for can -Do Multiple Sclerosis. Thank you for acting on the belief that you are more than your MS by attending tonight's webinar, Leisure Wintertime Activities by Beth Bullard, Occupational Therapist and can -Do MS Programs Consultant. I want to start tonight's presentation by talking a little bit about can -Do Multiple Sclerosis. Can -Do MS is an innovative provider of lifestyle empowerment programs for people living with MS and their support partners. We're at the start of a whole new way of thinking about and living with MS. Can -Do MS empowers people to move beyond their MS by giving them the knowledge, skills, tools, and confidence to adopt healthy lifestyle behaviors, actively co-manage their disease, and live their best lives. Can -Do MS launched our new website last summer, www.mscando.org. Please visit the website where you can register for upcoming webinars, listen to archived webinars, check out our upcoming Can Do MS Lifestyle Empowerment programs, share your Can Do promise, and learn ways that you can contribute or get involved with Can Do MS. So a few housekeeping items before we get started tonight. Uh, Beth will first uh, address all questions and comments at the end of the presentation. And we encourage you to uh, ask your questions and comments throughout uh, the presentation. So to do so, uh, just type your question in the chat feature located on the left side of your computer screen. So to submit that question, type in the small box that says chat with presenters. This presentation is being recorded and will be archived on Can Do MS's website. You're more than welcome to view the presentation again, and if you missed one of our other webinars, you can find the archived version on the website. For those of the for those of you who are attending live tonight, you will receive an email tomorrow with copies of this PowerPoint presentation. As many of you discovered when you logged into the webinar, new in 2011, you can listen to the live webinar through your computer speakers rather than having to call in. So the job of the live participants tonight is to uh, submit your questions and comments in the chat box, uh, complete the evaluation at the end of the webinar, and finally review the webinar schedule and register for upcoming webinars. And we've got some great ones. So we have a great speaker lined up for us tonight. Her name is Beth Bullard. And Beth has practiced occupational therapy for over 22 years. Her area of expertise is uh, adult neurological rehabilitation with a specialty in multiple sclerosis. She has been a member of the Can Do MS program staff for over 13 years and is employed at the Northern Colorado Rehabilitation Hospital as the patient assessment coordinator and the director of case management. So before we get started tonight, let's do a quick survey to uh, get a feel for, who, for who's on the call with us. So if you would, just uh, please tell us about yourself. Are you a person living with MS? Are you a support partner? Are you a healthcare professional or other? So we'll give it just a moment here for people to put their answers in. Okay, and it looks like we are 100% people living with MS. So with that all said, we'll go ahead and hand it on over to Beth. Hello, everybody. Welcome for joining us this evening. Um, I was really excited about being able to do another webinar because I had so much fun with the last one, and I hope you all um, take something away from the, the talk tonight. Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, so leisure wintertime activities. I wanted to talk with you a little bit about um, sort of what we're going to talk about tonight, the flavor of what's happening. Really looking at how we stay active and connected um, the, through the wintertime, but also throughout the year. So we're going to discuss the benefits of regular physical activity and social activity. What, what, is it, what does it do for us? We're going to identify common challenges the winter months can create. We're going to look at new and maybe alternative ways to be active and ways that you consider yourself active that you might not even know you are active and in ways that, that do help you move and, and, and are meaningful even though they may not seem like what you would consider activity or exercise. So let's talk about winter. Um, winter is actually a season of healing. 
I, I always enjoy doing these webinars because I learn something that I didn't know or something from a deeper perspective, and this is one of them. I always thought, you know, it's the new year. We watch the ball drop. You know, every, every ad and flyer you see in the paper is all about go buy this exercise equipment, and oh, you need a whole lot of plastic tubs to store all your stuff. Um, and, th and I thought, well, that's just, you know, the commercialism of the new year. So I came across an article, and it was actually talking about the winter solstice, which is the beginning of the season of winter. And it happened on um, December 21st this year. And what that looked at is they look at the seasons of darkness and light. And winter is, is the season of darkness, and the winter solstice is the longest uh, night of the year, right? So if you think of that yin and the yang, if you know that picture in your mind, um, that symbol that you see a lot, the yin is the cool energy and the darkness, and the yang is the warm energy and the light. And actually, the turning into winter, the winter solstice, is that turning from darkness to light. And for centuries, people have taken this season of winter and used it as a time of reflection and replenishment. It is a time to look and identify what our priorities are. How can we resolve new issues and create solutions? So it is about kind of letting things go and leaving things in, in the years past and moving forward. And that's why a lot of the, the, the ceremonies and the different things that happen at that time of year are there. Um, the birth of the Christ child, Hanukkah, um, the Chinese New Year, all of those are celebrations that were derived from that conflict between darkness and light. And I just thought that was kind of interesting and, and a little bit more of a deeper meaning to know that, hey, we as human beings have been doing this sort of resolving and moving forward a whole lot more than I had thought. So what a wonderful time to focus on your health and, and look at your lifestyle and a great time for you to personally refuel, to let go of those things that, that aren't serving you and, and move towards things that are going to help you reach your goals. So how does leisure fit into that? Well, I, I love this definition of leisure. The freedom from the demands of work or duty. Doesn't that seem great? Unhurried ease. Free and unrestricted time, something that's deliberate. We do it because we want to do it. I, I have a friend and neighbor who I adore so much, and she, she knows how to do leisure way better than I do, and I get so jealous. There's times on a Saturday I see I have all these activities to do. I get the laundry done. I'm doing this and that, and, and I go over and I drop something off. And what's she doing? She's sitting on the sofa reading a book enjoying herself, taking a, an hour out of her day to not worry about what's going on and actually feeding, feeding herself and refueling. And so I have a lot to learn from her, and I, I hope you guys can take something with that too, that it's, it, it's important to do leisure, and it's not something you should um, feel bad about, and it's something you should actually celebrate and put into your life, however that leisure looks to you. Leisure allows us to be creative. It allows us to use different parts of our brain. It helps us stay active and maintain a healthy lifestyle. And it helps us to connect to um, your spouse, your children, a neighbor, a parent, more than the day-to-day -day operational life. It helps you to create memories. So when we talk about maybe the physical elements that could be uh, potentially in leisure, I wanted to talk about what physical activity is and, and how we define that. Um, there's different types. The first one is aerobic activity. It's an endurance activity. It's that cardiac activity. It's getting your heart rate up. Your body is using muscles to, to move in a rhythmic manner for a sustained period of time, again, to maintain that moderate heart rate. It could mean brisk walking. You could be dancing around the house. You could be cross-country or downhill skiing. You could be swimming. You could be playing the Wii. All those are examples of aerobic activity. You're playing the Wii in, a, in an active mode, by the way, not the sitting down one. <laughs> now, resistance training is, a, is another type of physical activity. This is um, when the muscles have to work against a force. This is what you think about when you think about weightlifting. Maybe you're lifting a heavier object, um, even if it's just a one to two pound weight in your hands, or you're using those resistance bands. And sometimes even our body weight, the resistance of our body weight, we're, we're leaning against a wall and pushing back, doing sort of a standing up push-up, or you're doing a push-up on the ground, 
or you're um, raising your, your trunk up and doing a, a sit-up. That's, that's a resistance type training. Okay. Now there's another type that is incorporated a lot in those two, but it has its own benefits, and I wanted to mention that, is looking at bone strengthening activities. We all need to feed our bones and promote growth and strength within our bones. And the way that we do that is produce, putting a force through them. So whether you're, you're pushing down on a table with your arms, you're putting that force through your arms, you're feeding those bones. Standing up is a perfect activity of, of feeding bone strength. So um, if you're an individual who maybe is sedentary more or you can't stand independently but you can use a standing frame, that allows your body to get that weight-bearing activity to feed those bones and to keep your, your body healthy. Obviously running or walking or weightlifting or dancing, all of those activities that um, can be aerobic and strengthening also can have those bone strengthening components. But it's good to to look at what you're wanting to do and make sure you've kind of covered all the bases. The next um, area that I want to talk about is something that gets overlooked a lot, is making sure that we're ready to be active. Our, if we're going to go dancing or we're going to go out for a light jog or a walk, what do we do to warm up? How can we stretch a few of our muscles, um, twist our torso, make sure that our body is, is, well, is ready for the activity that we're doing and, and kind of get started slow. You may start off moving um, slower and then pick up the pace and then when the activity gets close to its end, you also want to slow down the pace. You want to let your heart rate come down to, um, to a, a quiet space in, in, a, this, in a nice rhythmic manner. Um, sometimes beyond stretching and walking, I wanted to talk about restorative yoga. Our, our, we do physical activity. We go out and, and do these things. And then what we need to do is embrace and enjoy um, what our muscles have just done. And sometimes getting in a restorative type yoga pose or, or just laying flat and, and doing some quiet stretching allows your body to sort of take in what has just happened to it, center it, enjoy, and embrace how it feels. That, that's part of, actually for me, the fun part of exercising. I, you know, I never want to get up and go out and do whatever it is I'm doing some of the time, but boy, when it gets over, the endorphins are running and my muscles feel good and it just, it, it, it's such a great feeling. So um, making sure you include those restorative type stretching allow you to embrace and enjoy that type of activity. And it is just as equally important. So now we're going to do a little poll. And what I want to ask is, um, are you currently physically active? And this is just yes or a no. And you don't have to quantify how much it is, but just do you, are you getting out there? Are you doing things? It doesn't have to be just exercise. It's just do you, think you, do you consider yourself physically active? So we'll give you some time to click that in. Good. So it looks like um, we got a bunch of yeses and only one no. We're going to turn that no to a yes after this talk, huh? Great job. So let's go on and talk about um, the benefits of physical activity. I read a lot of studies when I was putting this together, and a lot of them came up with some of the, you know, the same findings, that regular physical activity reduces the risk of many adverse health outcomes, such as heart disease, diabetes, stroke, depression, and falls. I have the falls is mainly because um, a lot of, uh, when you're active, you're working on your balance skills and you're working on your strength, so it decreases your incidence of falls. It improves our mood and our self-esteem. We talked about getting your, your heart rate going and getting those muscles moving and, and that positive endorphin feeling that comes from activity. So wonderful, wonderful mood changer. It increases our muscle strength and endurance, which allows our bodies to run more efficiently. Unfortunately, um, none of us are getting any younger every day, huh? And so the more that we can be efficient and effective in how our body works, the more energy we're going to have to do the things we want to do in life. Fortunately, physical activity helps us manage our weight. It helps us balance from the calories we're taking in to what we're burning off. It um, promotes a good sleep quality. Individuals who regularly exercise were able to fall asleep faster and had a deeper, sustained sleep. They did talk about um, 
physical activity uh, too close to falling asleep may be a detrimental to being able to do that. So you just want to do it a few hours prior um, for sure. People who um, were physically active had a more enhanced physical intimacy. You know, if we're feeling good about ourselves and our self-esteem is there, we're more apt to connect with uh, the individuals that are important in our lives. And it's also a huge stress reliever. So much of our life is um, the stresses, the emotional stresses of dealing with money and children and finance and driving and, and, and the, the stresses of work that it's so nice to be able to physically um, attune into our bodies and kind of check out from the stresses of what's going around and spend a period of time kind of just with yourself. Some other physical benefits we discovered was that obviously some physical activity is better than none. So just getting out there and move, do something, that's better than sitting and doing nothing. Most health benefits occurred with at least 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity physical activity, such as brisk walking. So in moderate, you know, you're, you're able to talk, you're moving along, and really it's just 150 minutes a week. And you go, oh my God, Beth, that's 150 minutes. But I broke it down. So let's say we do five days a week, so I'm not even counting the weekend, or you take a break weekend. That's just 30 minutes a day. And even if you can't do 30 minutes at one time, could you do 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes at night? That, I mean, 15 minutes, that's just what? A couple of commercials on a TV program? So I feel like one of those commercials on a TV program that says, it's just 30 minutes a day. You can do this. Invest. So think about it in that way. Put it in perspective. It, it's not a whole heck of a lot of time to, to be beneficial. Obviously, you can do more, but even to see a benefit, it doesn't take that much. Um, they found that both aerobic and um, muscle strengthening exercises were equally as beneficial. So it's really good to mix it up, try a lot of different things. That health benefits occurred for all individuals at any age, um, any racial or ethnic group that were in any of the studies, and that the health benefits of physical activity occurred for people with disabilities. The benefits of physical activity far outweigh the adverse outcomes. So if you're one of those people that goes, well, what if, or what if, or I can't, you've got to start turning that around knowing that um, anything's better than nothing and you need to get out there and, and move. Now, equally, let's look at um, the benefits of being socially connected. Uh, I also read a lot of studies on this, and I found it to be quite interesting, so I was excited to share. Um, individuals that are socially connected had a decreased likelihood of having colds, heart attacks, strokes, cancer, and depression. They um, had a decreased mortality rate compared to socially connected people. They had a decreased level of anxiety and distress and hostility, and a greater optimistic outlook on life. Sounds good, huh? Um, I was reading about a lot of different cultures, and like it or not, the, our American culture is a culture of individualism. You know, from birth, we are expected to be in a crib and sleep alone, and then we're expected to, you know, move and go away and get our own apartment and get your own life and do whatever. It's all of our jobs to to take our, this little being we have and move them on on their own. And so many others um, aren't that way. You know, there's a lot of cultures where people wouldn't even dream of living outside the family home, and there's multi-generational homes and, and everything else. So it's challenging to look at what really works for us and what's best, and knowing that, you know, maybe this culture of individualism isn't the fit for us, and maybe we need to look at being more um, dependent and interdependent, because we really are. And looking at it as not a failure that we can't be on our own. Of course we could be on our own, but it's good to need people. It's good to be with people. So it's important to kind of forge bonds and, and create a community for yourself, whether that's your immediate family or a neighbor or um, friends that you know through work, that, that that's going to help you with that, that more optimistic outlook on life and, as we see in the statistics, uh, live longer and, and have a healthier way of being. Other benefits that were cited was um, touch. Touch lowers blood pressure. It relieves stress and lessens symptoms of depression. So if you're with somebody in the room, you should probably start holding hands now <laughs> or maybe give them a hug. Um, if you're with a pet in the room, maybe you could get them close to you and start petting them. 
um, people who have pets have a decreased symptoms of depression. They have a greater connection. Um, connecting with friends increases serotonin levels in the brain, which improves mood. They uh, did a study with people that were actually texting and friends that text, and, and the amount of serotonin level that um, was, was secreted increased and the mood improved when they got these fun little texts from friends. So I say text away, but just don't do it when you're driving. Um, connections with the spiritual community. Uh, being spiritual, no matter what that looks like for you, is an important thing. And they did a study of individuals who were a part of a, a, a church community versus ones that weren't. And the people that were part of that spiritual community saw decreased stress levels and their life expectancy was three years higher than the other group, which I found was interesting. So now we're going to ask a little question about how you feel socially connected. Do you feel that you have very strong social connections, somewhat strong, average, maybe I need a little work in that area, or they're pretty weak for me? So I'll give you guys some time to do that. And I'll hit the skip the results button this time. That looks good. Okay, let's see. So we've got 7.1% that's a very strong. Oh, somewhat strong. That's pretty good. 35.7. There's always areas we want to grow. An average and, and some needs improvement. Good. So hopefully some of these ideas will help spur you guys up into that very strong category. So what's the benefit of, of doing something, sharing leisure activities, staying connected? Well, again, as we talked about uh, different types of research, I read an article about um, a woman's uh, softball group, and it talked about how they, they looked at their physical strength and, and their consistency of participation compared to it, people who were active uh, separately. And it shows that individuals see a greater physical gain, actually greater physical strength, when participating in shared activities. So why might you think that is? Well, I think that because it makes the activity more meaningful and more fun for the individual, plus you're, in some sense, in a friendly way, competing with somebody else, so the chances of you pushing yourself a little more are there, and that um, there's a shared commitment um, and an increased likelihood of success, meaning that if you know somebody's waiting for you, you're apt to show up a little bit more. You aren't going to find those excuses. Um, I have my, my same girlfriend who's the great book reader is also um, my running partner. And so she and I will partner up a couple days a week and we meet out at this ungodly hour of like 5.30 in the morning because it's the only time I have nothing else to do. Um, but I know she's going to be out there, darkness or light, this or that. And so I get up and I, I go. And, and it helps. It helps. You know, we have a nice relationship and a friendship because of it. I'm more committed to do the activity, um, and, it, and it makes it a whole heck of a lot more meaningful. So doing activities together strengthens relationships, and it increases opportunities for intimacy and friendship. And here we are in winter. Okay, let's talk about where winter can kind of trip us up. Um, obviously, it's darker still. The, the days are still long. Um, you go to work in the dark. You come home in the dark. It seems like it's always dark. Um, if you live up in Alaska, I think it is really always dark. But uh, so, so that can be a deterrent from you wanting to get out and do things. It can be a safety issue. Um, it's dull outside. It, it's, there's limited sunshine. And for some people, they really experience um, seasonal uh, depression that, that comes along with that limited sunshine. And they have um, come up with uh, lights and different things that individuals can use to help combat that if that's something that um, you experience would be something to visit with your physician about. Um, sometimes the temperatures are consistently colder, not always. In Colorado, you never know. It could be 70 one day and 20 the next. Um, some of us don't operate as well in cold temperatures. Some of us do, some of us don't, but it, it's definitely a deterrent. Um, in some parts of the country, you see a lot more rain um, and dampness and, and sleet, or you get the ice storms, which can be real difficult to navigate, and the streets and the sidewalks aren't, aren't safe to, to go on. In other parts of the country, you get more snow and ice. Um, sometimes that stays around for a while. Sometimes it 
it, it goes rather quickly. Um, I'm fortunate in Colorado where I live. Yes, we do get snow and ice, but we also have a lot of sunshine, so it melts away and um, the streets stay rather clear. Now, the problem we get in winter that is hard to get away from is the wind. Um, so often we can get really high winds, and, I mean, they'll knock you over. You'll get a 75-degree gust, and, and to go out and try to be active and be enjoyable, and that is just the pitiful. That's, that's the big turnoff for me. That's when I hit my treadmill is when it's windy. Now, I know if I have any friends from Wyoming um, on the call, they probably will say, yeah, have you seen wind? <laughs> but, hey, it does get pretty windy here, too. So we have the challenges of winter. Now we have the challenges that we create for ourselves. We look at ourselves. I call internal barriers. You know, we all have our attitudes about things and, and how much we value them and how they fit in the priorities of what we want to do. And then we have fears, fear of are we going to be successful? What does this mean for me? Is this going to change? Is this moving me outside my box a little bit? And I'm kind of scared to take that risk. So, and then we have external barriers, the influences of others. Sometimes, when we want to do an activity, it, it affects how others relate to us. It affects what they get their needs from. So you have to consider those when um, you're thinking about how you're going to be successful, the time it's going to take to be active, and then just what is the right environment for me. Uh, so if you go through some of the questions that I, I put on here, um, is this activity important to us? So my husband likes to um, ice skate, and we have a lake uh, by our house. And um, my kids have gotten into it, so it's, it's become a, a family thing. And so, yes, this is sort of important that we all go ice skating. Do we have a positive mindset? Well, um, they do. Uh, I, I kind of go on the fence a little bit. While I like skating, um, I get a little creeped out about it being on a lake. And I know they, they say that, that the ice is like so many inches thick and there's nothing going to happen, but it still makes me a little uncomfortable. <laughs> And then sometimes it's cold and it's kind of wet. So, you know, how flexible can I be as far as what time we go out and, and, and how long we're going to be out there and, and am I able to, to dress for it and have the right clothes on so I'm successful? And, you know, do we have reasonable expectations? I mean, I, I skate fairly well, but he is a hockey player. He skates really well. So don't expect me to get the stick in the puck and keep up with you because it's not going to happen. But I need to feel good with what I can do and, and not, not get hung up about it, okay? And then I need to not have any fear and doubt about that ice thickness. So those would be kind of ways I would think through that and talk with my family about. And, you know, do my goals impact others? Well, how do I gain their support? Um, if we all want to go do the activity, that, that's wonderful. If I need help with my technique, how do I get someone to help me with that? Um, and, and that may be the assistance that I need. And is the physical environment conducive? Is it the right time to go out? Is, is the ice ready to go? Or is it, is it starting to melt and not a safe place? And then maybe we go to the local rink indoors or we go down to the one that's in the shopping center areas. So there's all these things to think about when you're trying to, to plan a good social and, and leisure activity and making sure we have the right equipment, making sure that the skates fit and everything's sharp. So that's kind of how I would look at those barriers, identify them, and, and talk through them. Um, barrier removal is really a plan for success. It's so easy to say, I you know, have those friends that say, I'm just going to go do this. And then they get halfway through the activity or they get halfway through what they've done and then they wonder why they're failing and they're frustrated and they, they can't seem to finish it. It's because they didn't take the time to think through what it really meant to do the activity and how you set yourself up for success. The first thing you want to do is choose something that interests you. I mean, does it really interest you? So often I remember when I was younger you'd fill out these um, – little checklists about, uh, you know, what are your interests? And, you know, everybody writes, you know, hiking, horseback riding, this and that and the other. And I kept going, you know, Beth, you put horseback riding on there. You haven't been on a horse uh, in eight years. Is that really? <laughs> I mean, it may interest me, but it's not something that, that I have done or I seem to value to do. So I had to kind of check myself and get closer to say, what's really of interest to you right now in your life? You know, because interests change. So, so think about that. Um, and then identify what are those potential internal and external barriers that you may have and how you can engage others to help you um, remove those barriers. 
as we talked about, being part of a group or being having someone do the activity with you is, is the perfect way to get that commitment and help foster those connections. So who can you get to engage in the activity? Or if you really don't know anybody immediately, what groups are already out there that you can become a member of, that you can, can start to show up in? What time of the day or the week should we do our activity? Leisure is, is just as important as work and, and, other, and laundry and all the other things that seem to consume us. So making sure you can say, you know what, yeah, this two-hour block on a Saturday afternoon is my time for leisure, and this is what, this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to commit and make it a, an important thing. And to be successful in that is to organize yourself, to schedule it in, and to commit to it, to say, yes, I'm going to do this. And when you're scheduling it in, you've got to allow your enough time to engage and enjoy yourself. If you know it's going to take you 20 minutes to drive to this place and you're going to want to do this hour-long class that you're involved in and then it's going to take you the time to get back, give yourself that time. Don't plan anything else. Don't let anyone expect you'll be home any time before that. And don't commit to, to finish anything else. Let yourself soak it in and enjoy it. Look at the activity that you're doing. Can, if there's a part of it that's a struggle for you, can you simplify it? Can you modify it? Um, managing your energy level and decreasing frustration, that's what simplifying and modifying does. If something's hard and you're getting stuck, then you've got to say, all right, how could I do this differently? Could some of the parts of the activity be done in a less physical manner? So maybe you can, um, if you're doing, let's say you're doing interactive gaming with friends and you're doing bowling, you're doing archery, you can do that sitting down just as well as standing up, and, and maybe that's something that you do. How can the activity be divided up during the day or the week? Sometimes, yes, you, don't, you have limited bits of time, or maybe you have little bit, bits of your energy bank that wants to be spent. So plan that you're going to go out and walk the dog for 15 minutes in the morning and then maybe do 15 minutes at night, kind of a start of the day activity and a closing down at night. And prioritize. Look at allocating that time when you have the most energy to engage in leisure. That's the one. There's just as much time for work. You've got to put some energy and focus on, on what you want to do leisurely as well. Sometimes we need a tool to help us. Uh, we're creative people, we human beings. There's a lot of innovations that we've made over the years. We're not living in caves anymore. We um, don't just ride horses. We have cars. We have planes. I don't know the last time any one of us actually got up and changed the channel on a TV. I mean, we're, we're creative. We, we adapt things. We make things for our lives to be simpler. So there's so much adaptive equipment that has come out of helping individuals with physical needs that's in the mainstream market. Uh, take in chance the, the Good Grips products that they make for a lot of tools and kitchen devices, all with that thick, heavy um, black grip. That was, that was actually devised and, and was something as an occupational therapist I used with individuals 20 years ago. And it was to help with people who had a limited grasp and maybe some decreased sensitivity. Well, geez, now you can buy them at Target. They're everywhere. So, you know, there's just a lot that you can adapt and, and always just know that the creativity of the human mind is probably the best tool that you have. And, and there's always a different way to do something. Uh, most leisure equipment can be modified. There are lots of different ways that uh, bikes, recumbent bikes, and different things can be changed and, and moved around and turned so that whether you're trying to approach it from being in a wheelchair or from maybe needing to just to sit in a more supportive seat can be modified for you. Sometimes if we're individuals that um, need trouble, have trouble remembering or need help uh, processing through an activity and staying on step, using one of the many electronic devices that we have available with the iPhones and the Androids and the iPads and the different things to help move us from one step to the next in whatever activity um, that we want to employ ourselves in. I wanted to talk about um, mobility devices. Mobility devices are um, very empowering. And so often 
as individuals, we need all different types of devices depending on what it is we're doing. We may walk around our homes perfectly fine, but if we needed to go out um, because of it snowing or, or because of um, something else going on to navigate public spaces and have more balance, maybe we're going out into a big public event where there's lots of individuals and you're having to shift quickly to move without, those are the times to say maybe I should use a, a cane or maybe I should get some walking sticks. Or if it's going to be a, a, a long event and I want to have the pleasure of enjoying myself, then maybe I'll use a motorized chair or a, a wheelchair for part of it so I can have fun. You've got to look at that energy bank and, and how to use mobility devices to empower you and let you enjoy what it is you're doing because that's what they actually do. They make, they make going out in public more of a pleasure versus a trial. They help you conserve your energy. It allows you to kind of keep pace of the rhythm of what's going on. And honestly, they help people look less disabled than individuals who are struggling just to walk. Okay. Got another poll question for you here. So we're going to look at those seasons, and you're going to rank by season how active you are, four being most active and one being least active. So what time of year seems to be your better time of year? We're getting some in there. You guys are doing good. Thinking about it? We'll wait for a few more. Oh, here they're coming. I'm clicking through this. I don't know what's showing up on your screen. Mine has um, 12 people have responded. So, Beth, uh, it looks like um, most people are answering uh, as an average of, of they, they prefer um, the summer. So. Summer, well, spring and fall. Okay, because I didn't know if it would give them. You guys don't get to see a pretty graph on this one. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, that's an unfortunate part of this one. Well, that's okay. I'll go through it. Okay, cool. so um, right now you guys came in. Actually, fall came in the highest at 2.83. Then spring, 2.75. Summer, 2.25. And winter, 2.16. So winter is that, that harder time of year with summer, um, close at his heels, probably because um, some of you guys might have some heat sensitivity issues, I'm just guessing. And then the spring and the fall tend to be a little milder and, and flexible, and I could see where those would fall in. Thanks for giving us that feedback. So let's talk about ways to stay active and connected in winter. First of all, here's the logical one. We can just embrace the season. Enjoy the uniqueness of what's going on. Put on the parka and the hat and, and get out there and have fun. Um, try your hand at indoor or outdoor ice skating. You know, they make skates that um, have dual rails on them so it's easier to balance. Or if you're in a place that doesn't have ice, could you try some sort of roller blade or skate? Um, often they have these they have um, these little metal things that you can push on the ice similar to a walker, actually, and it holds you up. A lot of the kids use them. Um, Cross-country skiing is a great way to um, explore trails or different parks and on a, you know, when there's snow try snowshoeing or hiking. Some people don't get a lot of snow, so but it's also a, a wonderful time to go out and, and take in nature and, and hike. And, you know, sometimes the gray skies and, and the, the kind of the prettiness of, of just the bare trees is, is, is kind of a nice thing to take in. I find it sort of calming and centering. If you're somewhere that offers downhill skiing or snowboarding, um, that's a great way to, to take it in. There are a lot of um, resorts and different um, community places that will uh, sponsor trips like this. 
and they also have a lot of adaptive ski programs and different types of devices, so you can talk with them about what your challenges are, and they'll hook you up with an instructor and equipment um, to enjoy, enjoy the sport. I, looked at, I read a lot about Nordic walking. You go, well, what's Nordic walking, different walking? Nordic walking is um, walking with those poles. And I don't know if you've seen people out, they've hiked with them, and, and they're sort of like a ski pole, but they're, they're a little bit different with this little ball fashioned on the bottom. I don't know if any of you use them to walk with in general. But um, they're, uh, they use them a lot um, to train for skiing when it's in the summer activities. And what they found is that individuals had a 40% greater um, return on the activity because you're moving your arms and your legs and you're walking at the same time. So it actually was a very beneficial way um, to have year-round exercise. So it might be a nice thing to try. The other thing, hi, oh, and by the way, I was reading that the hikers and the backpackers, so if you're going to not just walk but you would think about using those off-trail, is that hikers and backpackers that use the, the Nordic walking poles and trekking poles talked about a lot of elimination of hip and knee and foot and back pain, that they had less complaints of pain and stiffness after going out and doing something like that than when they didn't have the poles. Uh, the other nice thing about winter is there is snow out there, and snow is fun. So if you have children or grandchildren or, or just a friend, uh, build a snowman. You know, when's the last time you made a snow angel on the ground? Or have a snowball fight. Um, if you're somewhere that doesn't have snow, make up a fun game at home. Get a bunch of um, white tissue paper, and you can ball it up and, and have your snowball fight inside. <laughs> it's warmer that way, and it's still kind of fun. If you're going to go outside, you have to hear some tips for success. Again, with our planning, it's just dress for the weather. You know, um, know when the sun's coming up and know when it's going down, what type of clothing and the changes you're going to experience. You want to avoid overheating because you don't. That sometimes can be detrimental for individuals with MS. So wearing um, those garments that wick away the moisture and allow that to be pulled from your body are, are good good ideas to have when you're outside. Definitely the layers to take off and tie around. Don't forget, um, you know, we lose a lot of heat out of our heads, and so having a hat or an earband is, is really important. Or sometimes both. Maybe you need to start with a hat, but you're going to trade off to um, just covering your ears as, as you heat up. Um, so have some pockets in your jacket. Make sure you have gloves on. You know, our fingers sometimes can be numb, um, and it's difficult to know how they're feeling, and so making sure you protect them. Understand that when your skin is together, there's more ways. Uh, there's more heat that's generated, that keeps you warmer. So sometimes a mitten is actually better than a glove. Um, the sun can be very uh, bright and can reflect off the snow and the ice. So make sure that you have protective eyewear on and sunscreen. Go with somebody. Again, take somebody with you. I got a theme there, don't I? Um, and make sure you take your cell phone in case something did happen and you have a way to contact somebody. If it's going to be dark, um, you can always get one of the headlamps that they, they use. Um, those are fun. We use those in the morning, my neighbor and I, to run, and it's kind of nice. And always having a reflective clothing or reflective light on yourself or even on your pet if you're taking your dog for a walk is a safe thing to do. And if you really don't want to be out um, too long and, and definitely in darker light, then just again consider going out um, twice a day in shorter times. You may want to go try the gym. Everybody's going back to the gym. So um, try out a fitness class. Become a regular. Meet new people and stay connected and committing to see each other. Maybe they have an indoor track that you can push, your, push a wheelchair if you're in one of those or walk around. Um, maybe you can look at those endurance and resistance and restorative activities to vary your routine. Try a class for this. Go work a machine for this. Um, the biggest thing that happens when we go to, to gyms is not, all of us are afraid to ask for help, and we're all afraid to figure out what the equipment's for and what would be best for us. So seek assistance from someone. Uh, ask about unfamiliar equipment. Figure out what works best for you and what doesn't. Um, a lot of the gyms will offer assistance from a trainer, especially if you're new. Um, they can, there's a lot of deals the first of the year. So you, you try some of those things. Um, and gyms aren't always gyms that you have to pay for. There's a lot of local rec centers, and there's other gyms within universities that you can get access in for uh, not a lot of money. So you can look in that direction as well. If any of you are working with a physical therapist or you have one you have worked with, engage them. Tell them what you're interested in doing and have them meet you at your exercise gym and teach you what's appropriate for you. 
swimming is another great way to be active in the winter. You want to, you may not swim, you may want to walk, but, but having that buoyancy and being in the pool and, and able to do the laps is, is great fitness. They do have classes um, in pools as well. The pools, many pools have ramps and lifts for entry, so it's good to call ahead and understand what those options are for you and if it's going to work. And um, making sure what the water temperature is. A lot of individuals with MS um, with 85 degrees is an ideal temperature. You don't want anything that's set to too hot um, that can tend to make you feel weak and, and fatigued. Um, there's a lot of flotation aids on there to help for a safe, confident experience that you can wear a vest. And then there's, in turn, there's a lot of resistance tools and activity um, exercises and different devices you can use to increase your workout when you're in the pool. Now let's talk about if we're just at home. How do we get to active and connected at home? Well, guess what? Try one of those fitness DVDs um, or even a fitness program. Sometimes just turning on the music and moving and dancing. Um, I did read something with a study that if there's fast music on, obviously we tend to respond to that and you burn more calories just with the general things you're doing, even if you're just going around the house cleaning. Um, interactive gaming with your Wii's and your Xboxes. Looking at some pieces of equipment that aren't expensive to purchase, dumbbells, maybe a Swiss ball, dumbbells, <laughs> Swiss ball, um, resistance bands, those types of activities that you can do at home with not a lot of room or, or cost. Um, again, if you have a stationary bike or a lot of people get one of those upper extremity or gonover cycles where you can use it with your arms and you can in turn use it with your feet, that's a great way to get a, a good upper body workout and get your heart going. Um, had to put this on here. Refresh yourself by cleaning your home. I read that um, if you cl an hour's worth of housework burns 200 calories. Plus, for, for type A's like me that love to have everything in little places, it feels good when you get done because it's all cleaned up. So you're with your family and friends at home. What other things can you do to stay connected? It isn't all about just physical activity. Host a board game night. Have a card tournament. Get your brains going. Laugh together. Maybe go bowling or play laser tag or go to the arcade. Have a tournament. Have your own like a Wii Olympics that you put together and, and do it over a series of weekends so it kind of takes you through the, the, um, the winter months. Um, prepare a meal and bake together. And, and I don't mean that by hosting people over. Have them over to cook with you. You don't cook for them. It's definitely something you do together. Um, have a picnic in your living room. If you have a picnic basket, or lay it out by the fire and, and have a good time. Enjoy yourself. Do a craft activity or building project that maybe you've put off, but, but have someone do it with you so it's fun. Um, pick an area of your home to clean out and organize. I had to do that again, Miss Type A. Again, you're going to burn those unwanted calories and get rid of those unwanted items. Take a walk together, maybe just 20 minutes before dinner. If you take a walk as a family or as a couple, my family's doing that right now. We're laughing. We're seeing who in our neighborhood is going to be the last to take their Christmas lights down. So we've got a little bet going on. Sometimes we find ourselves alone, and sometimes we're alone more than we want to be, and it's hard for us to get out of the home or we don't have a lot of people to connect with. This is where you can use the technology that we have to interactive online games. You know, Words with Friends is one that I know a lot of people play, and that way you can connect and, and do that little scrabble thing with whoever may be anywhere around the world. Um, connect through social networking. Look at online support groups and chat rooms. Maybe you can get some ideas from activities there and, and meet some people that, that share uh, your same interests. Use that Internet connection if you have a gaming system to play your friends and family in the Wii and the Xbox that may live somewhere else. And that way you may not get to see them, but you're having fun and connecting and moving. Explore your options to get out of the home. What are transportation services or individual groups that you want to get involved in that someone could pick you up and take you there and bring you back? Definitely connect with your pet. Make sure that you play together. Throw the ball. You know, Do the little... Um, Red, what is that, the LED light for the cat that they go crazy with? My dog loves that too. Um, and I invite people over. If you can't get out, how can you get people to you so that you can, kind of stay, you can stay connected? The other thing is getting involved. You know, it's, it, getting involved is just as much a social and connective activity and movement than anything else. Um, is there a civic organization you wanted to join to, to help the town be better? Can you become part of the mall walkers group and get into the mall and see what's happening? 
so many areas are looking for volunteers, whether it's schools or animal shelters or, or different groups or church. How can you get involved in, and feed yourself that way? Maybe you can take a class. If you're close to a university, a lot of times you can attend a lecture or look at a lot of times the local libraries will do lecture series and art things. You know, See what interests you there. Is there a book club you can join or even like a fantasy football league? I put these on there um, just so you guys would have this information. It's about accesses and websites to National Park Services for recreation and different information about accessibility. Um, in the out of doors and the travel and hospitali hospitality region. And then I also added one about adapted travel and resources and wilderness adventures. And then here's some the general resources of many great um, agencies that can help with connecting and answering your questions for your uh, winter leisure time activity goals. So we've talked a lot about um, what it means to move around in winter, where our barriers are, what are the benefits of all of this, and why it's good we should do it. Now it's time for you guys to develop your activity plan. So if you have a paper and pencil next to you, start and you haven't written anything down, maybe it's time to start. Start brainstorming some of the activities you wanted to try that you haven't. Start researching and thinking about what it is you want to do. And then when you do that, pick a few and try them out. Try out the activities or try out a change in lifestyle and routine. And, and stick with it for a little bit because it always is a bumpy, but you kind of want to go with it for about six weeks. And then you go back and say, you know, is this really fit in my life? Does it work out? Did I enjoy it or not? And why not? And how do I change? And always know that, you know, life is trial and error, and we learn through our mistakes. So you've got to be forgiving for yourself and, and others and, and just keep moving forward. Make the necessary changes. And again, like I said, move forward. So if you get stuck and you've asked a friend and a neighbor and everything else and you're not getting the answers you need, where, where can you go for help? Well, each of you needs to build and utilize your resource team. Who in your local healthcare team, be it a therapist or a physician, can help you with your goals? What about local chapters and national chapters of associations? Are there resorts and recreation centers that provide programming and assistance? What do the local and national parks programs offer? Do you have a community rec program? And what do uh, universities, churches, and schools, what all programs are available to you? Do a little research and see what you can work out um, to be successful. Finally, I always like to end with remembering that, that this is about what you can do and that living with MS is about finding solutions. Use that creativity in your human mind to remove those obstacles that are in front of you. Let go of the things that no longer serve you. Accept those that will make life more enjoyable. Remember that you are always in control and work to stay there. The quality of your life depends on it. Awesome. Well, what a great presentation. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, and we do have uh, a few questions here, so um, we'll try to get through as many as we can here. Um, and the first one is, does exercise reduce stress hormone cortisol? You know, I honestly can't answer that question. <laughs> okay. I, I obviously know that, yeah, obviously stress reduces cortisol, and I think I feel that activity um, definitely helps burn the, that stored body fat and burns the energy that's in there. But whether I can say it speaks directly to what cortisol may have added, I don't, or, or you know that level of cortisol, I wouldn't have that answer. You'd have to ask a physician. Sure. Sorry okay. about that. No, no problem. And um, you know, going through the winter months, it's quite obvious that we lose light, and you were talking about that early on. Um, is artificial light beneficial for your health? Yes, there are, and when I was researching, um, there's different types of it. It's a certain type of ultraviolet light that they prescribe for individuals that have that seasonal affective depression disorder, so you would have to go and talk with your physician about uh, what type that is, but it is sort of a UV light, but it's not just every light. It's not just like the light you have in the lamp in your house. It's a particular type of um, light that you would have around and wear. Okay, terrific. And... Uh, this is a great question. So uh, does it benefit your health to wake up earlier? Does it benefit your health to wake up earlier? 
<laughs> I yeah, honestly, I don't. I don't know if it benefits your health to wake up earlier. I would say more. You have to look at how your body functions and your body rhythms are. Each of us has our own time of day. Some of us are morning people. Some of us are night people. But we also have a culture in which we have to um, live and participate in. So there are times we're going to have to be up and be somewhere late, even though we'd rather get up at 10. So I think you have to kind of look at what what – is best for you and how that fits into your life. And if you're going to get up earlier, that's great. You, there's a lot that the morning provides. It's a quiet time. The world hasn't woken up yet. There's a lot that you can get done um, if you in, enjoy doing that. But in turn, then you're probably going to want to go to bed um, earlier in the night because the biggest thing is no matter what time you get up in the morning, you need to make sure you try to have a, a very good night's sleep. Um, so that's going to sort of just twist your day. Sure. Great. Okay, and uh, another question here. Um, are there any adaptive equipment companies that you would suggest? You know, there's a lot of different adaptive equipment companies on the market. Many of them are, are mainstream, and a lot of them kind of own each other. <laughs> okay. So I, I would say that you, you could um, go on and look at the particular device that you're wanting to get and um, put that in and it will pop up. There's several like Salmon's Preston and North Coast and other ones, and a lot of them have the products. A lot of them have the products at different prices. So it's good to do that research. And then know, like I said, a lot of products are also mainstream, so you can get a long-handled reacher at Walmart nowadays or at Home Depot. So, so shop around a bit and talk to people because you just don't want to pay too much for something if you don't need to. Okay. Terrific. And uh, one one last question here, and then uh, I do have a couple of comments that came in from some of our pitch participants that I'd like to share as well. <clears throat> and uh, the, the question is, is it beneficial uh, for you to break up your workouts versus one long workout? It's equally as beneficial. Um, yeah, when they did a, a lot of the research studies talked about the fact that no matter what increment in which your activity was in, you still received that same benefit. Okay, and is there is there a specific uh, time that you should uh, shoot for for aerobic exercise to be most beneficial? Usually, they cited around 20 minutes. Okay, but a lot of it depended on um, how quickly your heart rate was up or not, and you had to stay in that moderate zone of activity to to receive that benefit. Sure. Okay. Great. And uh, like I said, just a, a couple of comments from uh, some of our participants, and one that um, really kind of hits home for us around here, and um, uh, she's just speaking about Jimmy Hugan and how uh, his passions uh, encourage everyone to exercise and, and continue with living and, and doing it in a, in a, a way that, um, you know, is enjoyable and, and uh, uh, forward thinking and and I, I really like that uh, that comment that was a great one so um, and Beth you can probably speak uh, about um, Jimmy a, a little more than I can but um, mm -hmm. do you want to add anything to that yeah I mean Jimmy was always um, very very spirited individual and always definitely had that can-do attitude and um, no matter what was uh, seemed to be getting in his way he he never he just smiled at it and pushed on through and and always had um a a, a great way of of bringing the rest of us on and and it, it was nice and it's it's great to be a part of of his legacy sure sure and uh if anyone would like to know more information about uh jimmy and and his legacy you can definitely uh, get that information at our website www.mscando.org and uh i think we're going to leave it at that um we're running out of time here so um again thank you so much beth uh great presentation and a big thanks to all the participants who joined us for the webinar. We had a great turnout, and we're excited about the upcoming webinars. That said, the next uh, webinar is on February 14th, Valentine's Day, at the same time, 8 p.m. Eastern. The topic is Relationships and Intimacy, uh, presented by Dr. David Rintel, uh, psychologist and Can Do MS Programs Consultant. You can register for this and other webinars at www.mscando.org. For those participating live tonight, as soon as the presentation is over, you'll see a survey appear on your computer screen. 
Please take a moment to complete the survey and help us continue to improve our webinars. We value your feedback and input. Have a great night, everybody.